I'd like to introduce to you this morning uh, our guest pastor, and we're really happy to have him with us. Uh, pastor Jason Pence is from Beatrice, and he's connected with the Connections Church. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what the Connections Church does. He's married to his wife, Anita. Is that right? Anita also does ministry. She goes out speaking to other places. And they've been together at the church for three and a half years, and they have three college students, I mean, not students, but children. How do you do that? Three of them. <laughs> do they work hard? I guess so. Very fun. Would you please come, um, Pastor Jason Pence? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great to be here with you today. Uh, as uh, you shared, um, I'm Jason, and um, my wife is Anita. We have three kids that are basically college age or just a little older, and she's speaking at our church today, so they probably are getting the better of this deal, I'm sure they would think, but I'm thrilled to be with you, absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, when we moved to the district, um, this area, part of the country, I don't know, three and a half years ago, one of the first ministers I met was your pastor, Pastor Connie, and she just was very kind and welcoming, invited us to some events that happened here that we came to and just connected. And this is the first time that we've been able to schedule something. I think I had asked her to fill in for me last summer, and she was unable to with something that was going on. So it's the first time it's really connected, but we've had that uh, idea. And I just have a ton of respect for your leadership here, and I just honor them and am, am privileged uh, greatly to be able to stand in this place today. Uh, and we're just glad to be able to send greetings from our church to you. We're from, uh, I'm Pastor Connections Church. Really, it is a, there. It's about three things: connections, connecting people to God, then connecting them to each other, and then connecting them to their ministry or their purpose in life. And really, I just remember it that way. How do I get people connected to God? How do I connect them to each other? And how do I then get them connected to their purpose in life? And really, that's about all there is to serving God. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. It's the doing of it, not the hearing of it only. That's the challenge, isn't it? This morning, I want to talk to you about something that's really kind of close to my heart, um, and I think it uh, has an applicable angle to all of us, and so I'm hopeful this morning that I will be able to put something out there that goes into your heart and connects there and brings forth something from you that can see something changed in your life. What I want to share with you this morning is this. I want to share with you about what to do if your dream has died. What do you do if your dream has died? What do you do if the thing that was your dream died? And I want to give you a little context here. If we can go back in time and put ourselves into the mind of the first apostles. They walk in. We're approaching what we call Easter season. And the week before that, we'll have Palm Sunday. And it's coming quite quickly. But you may remember on what we call Palm Sunday, they were coming into Jerusalem. And the people were coming out and they were waving palm branches. And they were laying them on the, the ground and they were putting clothes on the ground, uh, capes on the ground. And they were walking across them and Jesus is coming in and the disciples have to be just ecstatic. Can you imagine? They, are, they have watched the Pharisees, the religious leaders, persecute Jesus. They've seen all of them try to turn the tide against him. And now the people are coming out saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the religious leadership says, shut those people up. Religion always tries to shut the move of God up. Always. Shut them up. Jesus said, if they shut up, even these rocks will cry out. Can you imagine how they felt? Finally, finally they get it. Finally, this is, they get it. They get it. It's the Messiah. This is the guy who's going to deliver Israel. This is the guy who's going to be the redeemer and break off the Roman yoke and set us free. They believe this. Can you imagine how those disciples felt having been outcast and talked bad about? Now they see the people recognizing Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, the son of David. They're, they get it. This is the guy. Can you imagine the joy that was in the disciples at that point as they come in? Finally, we're going to see this thing happen. Finally, they get it. Finally, we're going to do this. How full of joy they were. And yet, one week later, those same people that said, Hosanna, said, give us Barabbas. Let his blood be upon us and our children. And they watched that same Jesus crucified, dead, buried. And in seven days, their dream died. 
everything they believed in, everything they were holding to, everything they trusted in, in this man, God, Jesus, died on a cross and was buried, and the dream was dead. Can we put ourselves in that mindset? They had seen something happen that they could not have believed. They saw that their dream had died, their vision had vanished, their hope was now hidden and long since ridden into the sunset, gone. Now, as we know, that's not the end of the story, but I want to dra draw a piece of truth that the, I believe the Lord illuminated to me from a section of Scripture here. You remember then after Jesus rose from the dead, he's walking with the disciples on the Emmaus Road. Do you remember, recall this story where he walks with the two of the Emmaus disciples. In this story, we'll just pick it up here in Luke 24. He said to them, what things? What are you talking about? And they said, they were talking about concerning Jesus of Nazareth, the man who was a, a prophet, mighty in deed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief rulers and priests delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Catch this verse. But we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. They don't know this is Jesus yet. They don't know he's risen from the dead yet. But that phrase penetrated my heart, and I think it's probably true for most of us. Something happens that changes the course of our life, and we look at it and we say, I had hoped that would go differently. They said, I had hoped this was the one that would redeem Israel, but he's dead. Many here have had a dream that died, a vision that vanished, a hope that was then hidden, ridden into the sunset, not to be seen again, possibly. And sometimes if a dream dies, it's because a dream thief comes and takes it from you. There are some dream thieves, some things that will steal your dream from you. Even a God-imparted dream can be taken from you if we don't understand what's happening. This God, this vision, this joyful uh, thing of Jesus on the earth, they had it stolen from them. They didn't know where it would end up. The dream came back. The dream rose from the dead. But at this moment in time, they didn't know that. They just knew their dream had died. There's some things that... If you have a legitimately given, God-given vision and dream, there's some things that can take that because there's some people in this room, you've had a dream that your marriage would be good, but you have kind of let go of that because it's not worked that way. You've had a dream that your family would be tight and take care of each other, but when you get together at a family reunion, that's really not the way it works. Or you've had a dream that you were going to start a business that would maybe employ numbers of people and bring finances into the kingdom of God, and then something happened and it crashed. Now, I, I, I thought that was God's vision, but it, it, it went bankrupt. Maybe you had an idea implanted by the Lord himself to start a ministry that would touch people's lives, that would maybe reach people for Jesus Christ, turn them around, spark revival, bring people into ministry, bring them up in Christ. And you started that and something happened and it derailed and it went into the ditch and you don't really know why, but that dream didn't come to pass. It died. And sometimes if we don't lie to ourselves and we're honest, sometimes we don't ever go back and look at it because looking at that tomb hurts too badly. If we're honest, some things that may have left our lives and exited them hurt too badly to go see the memorial. And there's some things that can cause that to happen. One is time. Sometimes if we aren't connected with the end of the program in God, sometimes time itself can cause us to lose that vision, lose that dream. Things can happen. Criticism from other people, regret of choices. The scripture says what? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. Does anybody know? May exalt you in due season or in due time it may not happen tomorrow listen god doesn't settle up every friday he doesn't necessarily settle up the first of the month but payday comes he's not a shirker he's not a liar he fulfills what he said although it may not happen on our time frame but if we forget that time can take that from us you remember the story of abraham Abraham was promised through your descendant shall be descendants much like the sand on the seashore the stars in the sky but it went years without happening so he began to doubt and you know the story Sarah his wife comes up with another plan and they go with plan B that they made up and it caused all kinds of problems time itself had begun to take the vision and dream away from Abraham that God would do it the way he said uh, another one that can get you sometimes is Satan himself or demonic entities we have an adversary he doesn't like you And if you forget that you actually 
if you actually get on the spear tip and do something for God, the first thing you encounter is the thing on the spear tip for the enemy. And if we forget that, the pushing of that can cause us to lose the vision, lose the dream. The actual word for uh, being demonized, the imagery we have is to be like put inside of a vice and ground, pressured. Paul said that's what happened to him, the pressure, grinding. And in that moment, it's easier to let go of that vision and dream and go, maybe I missed it. Maybe that wasn't a ministry God had for me, but maybe it was because the enemy is a liar. He will tell you, he'll get on your shoulder. What are you going to do? I mean, you, you, this isn't working. This isn't working. What are you going to do? You look like a fool. This ministry isn't happening. You're a fool. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And he gets right here. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Pressure, pressure, pressure. Does anybody relate to this or is this just me? And we, I'll, pre- I'll talk about something else if you'd rather, but th- th- this is real. I mean, he's right here. It's not working. It's not working. You're just going to look stupid. You're going to look stupid. You're going to look stupid. This, this happens to everybody that did anything for God. The enemy always tries to talk them out of it. Compromise. Just compromise a little. Quit. What are you going to do? You look bad. You look bad. You look bad. You're going to look bad. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Pressure, pressure. What are you going to do? This is the best answer I've ever found. I said, I don't know, but I know this. I've read the end of the book. And one day you're going to be chained and cast into the pit and the lake of fire, and you're going to be tortured for all eternity for all of us to watch. And then I'm going to ask you a question. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Huh? If you get attacked, don't take it. Attack back. Attack back. Make demons sorry they came to your house. Fine, fine. You know what, demons? That's fine. Do that. But you know what? I'm fasting for a week and praying, and I'm going to win 10 souls into the kingdom. If you come back, I'll do it for a month. Hit where it hurts. If you don't do that, you lose. We've become such pansies in the North American church that we've forgotten what it is to be warriors. Praise the Lord. I'm glad I came to hear this today, huh? <laughs> it's true. We need, to, it, we need to be in the words of Paul. We need to endure hardness as a good soldier. He said, endure hardness with us. No man who serves as a soldier for Christ entangles himself with civilian affairs so he may please his commanding officer. Paul gives us this beautiful imagery in 2 Timothy 2 of what it means to stand on the spear tip for God. Uh, Satan himself, de- demon entities, they can take your, they can take your dream. Friends and family can take it sometimes. And this is a hard one because we love them and they love us. Good ones encourage, bad ones will tear you down. But sometimes your friends and family can be the thing that takes your vision and your dream away from you. And this is hard because what they normally do is try, they're trying to help. And they say, you're just, you're just extreme, you're just excited. And so they try to talk you down off of your zealousness for God. They try to get you to just calm down a little bit. I mean, Jesus is fine and all, but you don't have to be nuts about it. And so they try to talk you, hey, that's great, but maybe you shouldn't reach for that big of a vision. Reach for down here. And they'll try to talk you out of it. And they're doing it because they they love you and they think you're going to make a mistake. That's why this one is hard. How many of you have ever gone crabbing at the ocean? You actually lived close enough to the ocean. One, okay. A couple of us. Not too many, but a few. There's an interesting thing that happens. If you get one crab and put it in the bucket, it will escape unless you put, it, put something on top of it. It will climb out. If you get two or three crabs or more, none of them will escape. None of them. And here's why. When one starts to actually escape, the others grab it and pull it back down. And there's a lot of Christians that operate that same way, aren't there? As you begin to take off for God, they'll say, no, 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 don't, don't, who do you think you are? You're just getting full of yourself. Don't get the big head. And you begin to say, we're going to reach this city. We're going to see things change. We're going to see 100 people come to Jesus. We're going to see sick bodies made well. We're going to see people launched into ministry. We're going to make an effective change in things. And they say, oh, just calm down a little bit. And they try to pull you back down into the mediocrity of the crab bucket. And sometimes you've just got to shake it off and say, I'm not, I'm not going in the gutter with you. I love you I, more than life, but I will not stay in that bucket with you. Sometimes you have to do that to fulfill the vision and dream God gave you. Sometimes life circumstances can just take your dream or vision. Situations happen that make us think your vision won't come to pass, your dream won't come to pass. Things, can, things naturally occurring in the course of life that happen to you can make you believe that the dream and vision you had will not come to pass. Like dying on a cross. The disciples had a dream, and they saw their dream die on a cross, so it's not going to come to pass, they believed. 
Sometimes things come into your life and it crucifies your vision and it crucifies your dream and you wonder, can that thing ever be alive? No, it's dead in the grave. And you watch your dream die, your vision vanish, your hope now be hidden, ridden into the sunset with no chance of coming back, it seems. These things can take your dreams. They are dream thieves. And I think if we're honest, most of us can say there's something in maybe in a family or a business or a ministry or a relationship in our life, in our finances, somewhere that we've had a vision, a dream that we thought was from God possibly that died. And maybe we just don't go look at it anymore. That relationship is too broken. That's just too messed up to try to fix. That financial issue is just too much. I'll, just never get out, I'll never get out from under it. That ministry can just never fly. It just won't happen. And you just leave it in the tomb. Now, let's flip this a little bit because this is kind of negative, honestly. But if you aren't honest, you can't ever find a, a true solution. If you aren't accurate in diagnosing the problem, it's really difficult to find that accurate solution to change it. So this helps us get a handle on that. But now let's flip this. Because what do you do when your dream has died? Maybe one of these things has happened to you and one of your dreams has died. What do you then do when your dream seems dead? What will you do when your dream seems dead? And I just want to give you a couple of strategies here that are really, really good and will help you. Hebrews 10.23 tells us this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Okay, hold, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us what? Hold fast. Grab on to it. Hang on to it. Don't let it get away. In fact, one good translation of that is sit on it. So like you grab it, you put it, and you get on, sit on it. You're not going anywhere. Okay. How many of you are honest enough that you'll admit that you used to watch Happy Days? Huh? Three honest people. Come on. <laughs> How many of you remember this phrase? Sit on it, Potsy. How many of you remember this, huh? Okay. That's a cute little analogy, but it helps remember. When your dream starts to get away, sit on it, Potsy. You grab that thing and say, you're not going anywhere. God promised this to me. God said it's true. I don't care if it looks like you died. You're staying here with me and you're not going anywhere. You were a promise from God and I'm hanging on to you. Put it there. Keep it there. Don't let the enemy or your mind or your cooked up, messed up family members or anybody else take God's given vision from you. Grab a hold of it. Keep it there. One thing you can then do is recall it. Recall it. Bring it back clearly to mind. Go back to the beginning and say, wait, what did God actually speak to me? Abraham forgot that. He kind of got talked over time into something else. But what did God actually say to me in the beginning? What did he actually say? In your video, what did he talk to you about with that relationship? What did he talk to you about starting that business or, or the finances? Or what did he talk to you possibly about starting a ministry or being involved with one? And the results that would come from that. Go back and recall what God actually gave you as the vision. What is the actual promise that he laid down there? Recall that thing. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, speaking of Jesus, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Bring it clearly back to mind. When Jesus went to the cross, what does it say that he did? He looked at the joy set before him. That's how he endured the cross, despising its shame. What was the joy? The scripture tells us that it was the birth of his kingdom and those people who would be his followers. So when he is enduring things he does not want to do, you remember the garden he prayed, Father, I don't want to do this. Let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this. But if there is no other way, then I walk to that cross I endure death. I endure the separation from, from the Godhead. My God, my God, Father, Holy Spirit, why have you forsaken me? If there's no other plan, then not my will, but yours be done. And he says, for the joy set before him, he endured that. He looked at the joy. He looked at the promise. You are going to turn in one moment. All mankind was, sin, was ingrained with sin nature because of one man's sin in Adam. Now, by one man's act of righteousness, all men have access to righteousness with God through Christ and his blood if they'll receive it. In one moment, the first Adam wiped us out. In one moment, the second Adam brought eternal life to all that would receive it. 
And everybody that would receive it would become his heir and joint heir with Christ. And he looks at that joy and says, I'll go through this process because I see what the actual promise is. You've got to sometimes recapture what he gave you. Think about it. Bring it back in. Don't let it slip away again. Recall it. Recapture it. Another thing that's really important to do sometimes is to simply refresh it. Sometimes it's just a, a simple process of going back and beginning to water that thing with prayer. It's died. But now you begin to water that thing and say, God, maybe, maybe I missed something here. I believe you gave this as a promise. I believe this relationship can be restored. I believe that I can have the family put back together. I believe that I can see that ministry fulfilled. I believe I can see that business started. Or I believe I can see the financial situation turned around. If I will obey your principles, I'll do these things and begin to just rewater that. Begin to pray about it. Begin to talk to him about it. Then begin to maybe look for strategic alliances. Are there people that if you're looking for them, God maybe brings across your path? You can learn more from a mentor in 20 seconds than you can from 20 years of experience. Let me give you an example. If you know nothing about business taxes and you try to do your own business taxes, you can cost yourself literally millions of dollars. And yet one mentor who is an expert in business taxes can give you three or four pieces of advice that save you millions of dollars. What's the difference? They have the knowledge. They have a mentor. If you need a mentor in an area, two things you have to remember. You have to respect. You have to respect their knowledge and their time. If you don't respect the knowledge and don't respect the time, good mentors won't give you any. Although very good mentors, when they see somebody that actually is hungry and respects the knowledge and respects the time and honors that, they're very, normally very willing to share that because there aren't many people that do. And they want to see what's inside of them replicated into other people. And so you can have that replicated into you. So this person that has the business tax knowledge can help you uh, absolutely gain ascendancy in that area. Water with prayer. Look for strategic alliances. Look for opportunities to enhance it. What are ways that I can actually work on that dream a little bit? What are ways that I can, can se seem to move this thing forward just a little bit and do that? Uh, perhaps maybe at some other time I'll, I'll be able to kind of go next step in here and, and share with you maybe about this is how you resurrect a dead dream. This is how you resurrect the dead. But this will help you begin to what to do when your dream seems dead. The last thing I would think about is this. Rehearse it. Rehearse your dream. Prepare to launch it. See yourself fulfilling it. See yourself doing it. You know, I don't want to make this phone call. It's going to be nasty. I'm afraid it'll be a fight. But I believe if I come with the right attitude and I pray, pray and ask the Lord to help me, that when my ways please the Lord, he can make even my enemies to be at peace with me. That's what Scripture says. I believe this can be healed. I believe that can do that. Or this ministry, I don't see where it's going, but I, I know that if we begin to do these things, God can do something. And you begin to see yourself doing it. Begin to rehearse it. Begin to go back and say, what was the thing he placed inside of me? What was the heartbeat of that thing? And begin to rehearse that and go refresh that thing. Put new oil on it. Put new anointing on it. Put new prayer. Put new water of prayer on it. And begin to see that thing grow again. See that dead plant maybe take on some little green leaves and begin to sprout up again. And it may not develop overnight, but over time, it very well may. Particularly if it's actually a God dream. What to do if your dream has died? What do you do? Uh, did you come back to the keyboard? We're going we're to just take a little time here. What do you do? Some of you may have had dreams that died in the past. In fact, guaranteed, most of us have. We've had relationships that went bad, finances that went bad, ministries that didn't, didn't take off. We've had bro broken apart relationships in families. Uh, we've had employment things, all kinds of things that potentially were dreams, visions given by God that we appear to look at and see that they're dead. That's exactly where the disciples were. Jesus is dead in the tomb, and this dream is dead. But Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. And their dream didn't stay dead. And your dream doesn't have to stay dead. Okay, if you heard nothing else this morning, catch this. I'm not denying the reality of what happened, happened to you. Catch that. I'm not denying the reality of what may have happened to you, how bad, however bad it may be. 
I'm not denying the reality of it, but I emphatically deny the finality of it. They could not deny Jesus was dead and in the tomb, but they could deny that that was the finality of it because he was coming back out of the tomb. Just because your dream may have died is no sign it will stay dead. God resurrects dead things. He puts families back together. He puts businesses back on course. He puts ministries under an anointing and causes them to reach and grow and touch people's lives. It's not a denying of the reality. It's a denying of the finality. And sticks, uh, why don't we just stand to our feet this morning? I'm not really sure how you kind of uh, custom do, customarily do things here, but we're going we're gonna to sing this about the, about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit coming. It's funny, I, was, I actually sang this, sang this to myself on the way up driving this morning up here. We're going to open, uh, open up the altar time here. And if you're here and you've got something, Maybe you have an estranged relationship with a spouse or a child or a family member. Or maybe you've launched a business that didn't go well. Or you've got a heart for some ministry that just isn't happening. God wants to begin to work with you to bring that thing back out of the tomb. It may have died, but that's okay. Jesus died, but Jesus lives. Your dream may have died, that's okay. Just because it died doesn't mean it won't be alive. Sometimes it just means bringing it back out of the tomb. Sometimes it just means having the courage to go back to the tomb and say, I know that you went in there and it's been too painful and I would never even go in there and look at it because it hurt. But you know what? On the third day, the angel rolled the stone away so they could see what wasn't in there anymore. And maybe for some of you this morning needs to be a day you kind of roll a stone away and say, my dream isn't staying in there anymore. I'm not going to watch my family go down the toilet. I'm not going to watch my, my ministry not flourish and happen. I'm not going to watch the business or my employment not bring about what it's supposed to do. That's not okay. I'm going to go in there and resurrect that thing back by the power of God. If you've got something like that, why don't you just come and, sp and, and spend a little time in prayer. The Holy Spirit can do more in 60 seconds in His actual presence than all of us combined can do, can do in years and years. You don't need a touch from me. You don't need a touch from anybody. You need a touch from the Holy Spirit. It's not my hand. It's his anointing that breaks the yoke. And if there's a barrier over your dream and your vision, it's yoked in, it's tied in, it's, it's, it's bound in there by a stone, the anointing of the Holy Spirit breaks the yoke that holds things back. Amen? Amen. Bow our heads for just a moment. Father, thank you. For your word, it's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. The entrance of your word gives light and understanding to us. Grass withers, the word there, the flower there falls away, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. You said that you've exalted your word above your name, and that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It was with God and was God Jesus. This morning, there are dreams and visions given by you in the hearts of some of these people that need to come back out of there out of the tomb they need to come back into this earth they have ministries that we need operating in this earth they have businesses we need opened to create employment opportunities they have families that have strains that need to be put back together so there's unity amongst them and they can walk in unity with each other and maybe a hundred other visions and dreams that you've imparted into them that I'll never have a clue about but they know because you spoke it into their heart this morning, right now, spark some of those. Spark some of those. Just like on that third day when the stone was rolled away this morning, start rolling away some things that they can see and understand and comprehend. Give them wisdom, understanding, discretion, and a good heart. Understanding heart to perceive what your plan and purpose in this is. In Christ's name, amen. If you got something like that, just, just come on up and just take a few moments. Take some time, pray long or short, but take some time and begin to say, God, what about this dream? What about this vision? What about this thing? And begin to let him bring that thing out of the tomb. Don't let it stay dead. Don't let the enemy rob you. Don't let your vision stay dead. Let God resurrect that thing back to life and bring it into the earth. Amen? Amen. If you need to pray about that or if you want prayer for anything, I'll be glad to pray with you. But it's really important, I think, this morning that if you have something like that, take some moments and actually touch base with God about that and begin, him to, lend to, begin to work in that to bring that dream back to life. Amen. could ever come close nothing can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord. I've tasted and see
to God. We've been truly blessed this morning. I believe there is so much that God wants to do. But you know the thing that we come to church for? We come for God's presence. You know, what's, what do we want to come here for if he's not here? But God is in his house. And I, so many people walk away feeling um, that Radiant has that heart heart of God, that love that we share with one another. That's so important. What the world needs now is love, God's love. We could sing it that way. And I want to just encourage you, as you go off from this church, there are millions of hurting people out in that audience that we have. There are 168 hours in a week, kids. We spend two of them in church. What are you doing the rest of the time? What are we doing the rest of the time? Our pastor this morning is just showing us if there's some reason why you're not out there doing what Jesus told you. Remember, we asked you before, well, we're supposed to be doing what Jesus did. What do you do? Went out and loved people right into the kingdom. That's the easiest thing. Jesus said, I only please my father. Who is his father? His father is love, and love is of God. So he's pleasing his father. The rest of the, even when he was crucified, did he care what everybody was saying, would care uh, about the whole thing? He wanted to just do what his father sent him to do. From the foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. I just encourage all of us to just take to heart the words that God says about love, about himself. Take them to heart. Because God is looking for open hearts, he told me. People who are ready and willing to listen to the truth of God and then take it and eat it and chew it until you get it so part of you that, that you don't have to make any overtures about, I'm a Christian. All you have to do is be one. Just go out there and love the people that are unlovable. And God's gonna, that God is showing in prophecy that he is going to bring in those undesirable people, the people, you know, in the days of long ago, back in the 70s and the 80s, the people that had the tattoos, we have a few, and earrings in their nose. God says he's bringing them in. You know what he's going to do with them? He's going to put them in leadership because the leaders are not leading. He'll take the keys away from them, and he'll give it, give it to those who are ready to go out there and make a church and have a church that he wants for this time that we live in. I love you all. I've been with you for 11 years. I tell you, I love you on my heart. But we have to all come together and love the people that are outside these walls and bring them in. They'll want what you got. Don't you want them to watch what you, want what you have? I'm going to encourage you, please, again, to take a look at the... Um, gospel school of, super, of the supernatural. Anybody want to live in the supernatural? <laughs> oh my. <laughs> what a world. What a world God's created in that. So I, please look at it. Look at the schedule on the back so you know whether or not it's a feasible thing for you. And um, I believe it will be. Make it a feasible thing for you. Just make it a priority. And then make it a priority to bring someone with you and that'll be even greater greater, greater things will happen. If you want 
any more any prayer more than we've had offered for us this morning um, the prayers community or prayers um, ministry will be up front I just thank you again pastor pastor Pence thank you for coming we enjoyed every moment God loves us and he has so much in store for us so father we thank you this morning we thank you for the worship team and leading us into your presence making us more and more aware of that's why we come to church, we come to worship you. Do you know that in the, in the Bible, worship is a very important word because what you worship dictates what you're going to be and what you're going to do. So, Father, we worship you this morning, and we worship you every day of our lives, and we thank you for the grace, the mercy, and the love to go out from this church and take Jesus every place we go. There was an evangelist not too long ago, Gary Wilkerson. God stopped him one day and said to him, Are you taking me every place you go? I want you to ask yourself that. Are you taking God, Jesus, every place you go? I challenge you to try that. It's a whole different world. It's a whole different world. So, Father, we thank you for the grace to do that. We thank you for the grace to do everything, because without you, we can do nothing. With, with you, all things are possible. I thank you. We thank you. To you be the glory for the things you will do. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Have a glorious week in the Lord.